what you get in nitrogen chemistry is every conceivable oxidation state. If we look at nitrogen, we can basically take nitrogen with a less electronegative element. So if we take nitrogen with a less electronegative element, hydrogen is less electronegative than nitrogen. So formally, if we form a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, when we break it, the pair of electrons goes to the nitrogen, so the nitrogen has a negative oxidation state. If we have three of those hydrogens, then the oxidation state of nitrogen in the ammonia molecule is minus three. Now if we go to the opposite extent here, if we take a nitrate, and we have to be very careful with our nomenclature here, we take a nitrate anion, NO3 minus, obviously the charge on that species is one minus. Oxygen, what's the normal oxidation state of oxygen? Minus two. So we have the oxidation state of nitrogen and three times minus two is equal to minus one. So by a bit of trivial algebra, we can see that the oxidation state of nitrogen in the nitrate anion must be plus five. And we'll see we get essentially everything in between. The obvious place to start when you're surveying an element is with the element in its elemental form. And there is only one allotrope of nitrogen. There aren't many elements that you can say that definitively for. Oxygen, even oxygen, has more than one allotrope. The N2 triply bonded molecule. And N2 is very special. It's an inert gas. We know better than that. It reacts with very few species, but nitrogen will react, for example, with that lithium will go black, it will tarnish in a nitrogen atmosphere as it forms lithium nitride. But very few elements will react directly with nitrogen. So it's an inert, relatively inert gas. Why is it relatively inert? Well, it's non-polar. If you're going to predict the reactivity of something, you have to look at its polarity. So nitrogen N2 is non-polar. Obviously it's non-polar because the two nitrogen atoms have the same electronegativity. And it's triply bonded. Any reactivity of N2 requires us to break a triple bond, a non-polar triple bond, with a bond dissociation energy of plus 944 kilojoules per mole. Nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is extremely important to us. There are nitrogen containing, obviously, amino acids. The name is telling us straight away. Nitrogen is very important in nature. But you can't get nitrogen very easily just from the air. No plant very readily just takes up nitrogen and turns it into amino acids. So how did nitrogen get into the biosphere in the first place? Well, in the primeval soup, of course, there was probably a lot of storms going on, a lot of lightning. Now, under the very high energy electrical discharges associated with, with lightning, then nitrogen, under those very high energy conditions, nitrogen can be oxidised up to nitrates and nitrates. Those are high oxidation state compounds of nitrogen. Now, if we were relying entirely upon lightning as our only source of bioavailable nitrogen, then there would be a lot less life probably on Earth because there wouldn't be enough nitrogen. Nature is very special. Nature manages to evolve all sorts of things and nature has managed to evolve bacteria that can do the quite extraordinary chemistry of taking this spectacularly strong nitrogen-nitrogen bond and activating it and turning it in the first instance into ammonia and then once you have ammonia, ammonia is not a, is, is a reactive molecule unlike dinitrogen and you can do all sorts of oxidation chemistry and stuff on that. Those of you who have done the special topics lectures will know all about the, the generation of of ammonia in the first instance and indeed its subsequent combustion and oxidation to give nitrate type compounds. And that's known as the Bosch or Harbour Bosch process. And essentially what you do is you take nitrogen and hydrogen and you make ammonia. Now this, as you can look at that reaction immediately and realise that this is a reaction that is going to be thermodynamically really quite difficult to drive. In order to do this, you're going to have to have very high pressures. High temperatures would not actually favour this reaction, but because this molecule is kinetically so inert, you have to have pretty high temperatures in here. So the only way to drive this reaction is to work at very high pressures, 
And because it's kinetically so inert, you need to use a catalyst for this process. And the catalyst that is normally used, it is indeed in equilibrium. Yes, thermodynamically speaking, it is not favourable. So what you have to have is a situation where you can speed up this chemical reaction. And then the position of the equilibrium is going to be dependent on the conditions present in this system. And at higher pressures, it becomes more favourable because the entropically unfavourable process of going from four moles of gas to two moles of gas is ameliorated somewhat. You cannot drive this reaction to completion. You have to find a set of conditions which is essentially a, a compromise between the thermodynamic requirements of an entropically unfavourable reaction and the kinetic slowness of basically activating this nitrogen compound. So that's what Harbour and then later Bosch came along and turned it into a viable industrial process. And this is a remarkable process. It won two Nobel Prizes. This single reaction won two Nobel Prizes. Harbour won the Nobel Prize for discovering the chemistry and Bosch won the Nobel Prize for turning it into an industrial process and actually producing significant quantities of ammonia with it. Once you have ammonia, you're into your nitrogen cycle. You can do all sorts of derivatization chemistry from ammonia. Dinitrogen, very difficult to work with. Ammonia, easy to work with. Lots of things that you can do with ammonia. So that's ammonia. Ammonia is in oxidation state minus three, and it is indeed a volatile gas. Let's move to nitrogen in oxidation state minus two. Whereas ammonia is an obviously very important compound, hydrazine is an NN single bonded compound with two hydrogens on either end. So if you were to draw a Lewis structure for it, you would predict that it would have two lone pairs. And if you then do a VSEPR analysis, you're going to ascend, uh, predict essentially pyramidal geometry at both of these nitrogen centers. How do you make it? You make it most conveniently in the laboratory by oxidizing ammonia. So ammonia is in oxidation state minus three. If we do a one electron oxidation of it using our, our um, chlorate anion here, then we can actually oxidize it to hydrazine. Now, hydrazine is an interesting name. Sounds a bit like um, a hydro prefix suggesting water-like properties, and that's indeed the case. Hydrazine is called hydrazine because its physical properties resemble water. And indeed, it mixes very readily with water. When you buy it, it's very difficult actually to separate it from water. And when you buy it, you normally buy it as a distillable hydrazine hydrate. So you normally dry it as one molecule of hydrazine and one molecule of water. If you have pure hydrazine, then it has physical properties that are very similar to water. It's clearly got hydrogen bonding capability because it has polar NH bonds and it has lone pairs of electrons. And it has a melting point of 2 degrees centigrade and a boiling point of 113 degrees centigrade. And if you compare that, I don't think I need to tell you what the melting point and the boiling point of water are, but this is clearly very similar physical properties to water. Hydrogen is a bit peculiar, though. It is what we would call endoergic or endoenergetic. These are strange words. What they essentially mean is that this compound is thermodynamically unstable with respect to its constituent elements. So it is thermodynamically downhill to go from hydrazine to nitrogen and hydrogen. That's what endoenergic means. It's thermodynamically unstable with respect to its constituent elements. And indeed, delta G of formation is plus 149 kilojoules per mole. That means that hydrazine is what we would call an energy-rich material. It is going to give you more energy to combust hydrazine than it would to combust nitrogen and hydrogen. And that is quite a useful property because hydrazine has actually been used as the reducing agent in rocket fuel. In order to have a rocket fuel, then rocket fuel could be just hydrogen and oxygen. The space shuttle uses hydrogen and oxygen. So you, or at least the, the, the solid fuel boosters do not, but the main <coughs> engines on the space shuttle are just hydrogen and oxygen. So hydrogen is a reducing agent, oxygen is the oxidizing agent. You can also use hydrazine as your 
reducing agent in these systems. And because it's such an endo-energetic compound, it can be favourable to do that. However, although it's kinetically firmly stable, so we can boil it, it is potentially explosive. Because there's all that energy tied up in it, if you do get over that kinetic barrier to make it decompose with respect to its elements, then that will essentially then run away. And if you have a runaway chemical reaction liberating large quantities of gas, that's the definition of an explosive. So hydrazine, if you put enough energy in, is potentially an explosive compound. And you don't need all oxygen in order to actually get it to explode. Once you put the heat in, it can explode all on its own. Hydrazine is a good reducing agent if we look, or a modest reducing agent in, acid, in acidic solution. So it has a reduction potential of minus 0.23 <coughs> volts. It's a stronger reducing agent in basic solution. So if we don't have a lot of protons present, then it is a stronger reducing agent with a reduction potential of minus 1.16. We'll come back to reducing agents later in the lecture course. Right, so we've done minus 3, we've done minus 2. What about minus 1? Well, a slightly more obscure molecule still is hydroxylamine. Hydroxylamine is a hydroxyammonia-derived compound. So if you replace one of the hydrogens with an OH group, then you, pro you produce hydroxylamine. And of course, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Because oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, the oxygen is in oxidation state minus 2. The hydrogen is in oxidation state plus 1, and therefore the oxidation state of nitrogen must be nitrogen in oxidation state minus 1. And this reagent is also unstable with respect to its constituent elements, although not so much as hydrogen, and is a mild 